hey guys, uh, it's Leo here with a quick update. Uh, I spent yesterday, Sunday evening, a uh, couple of hours working in Unreal. And uh, I wanted to, as we prototype this project, this game, um, one of the first things that, at least in my opinion, uh, you need to prototype is the player character controller. And that's that's pretty much the, um, the thing that the player is going to use to navigate and move around the world. So the player character controller uh, needs to do different things like have inventory, right? So you pick up like keys and key items to unlock doors, blah, 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 health, stuff like that. The player character is going to, you know, run or jump or crouch or crawl or punch or kick or shoot or run away or do whatever you needed to do for your game, right? So... Um, so I went ahead and started the prototype, a very quick iteration, and that's kind of one of the cool things about Unreal Force. You can you can iterate and prototype extremely fast and uh, pretty easily, depending on what your ambitions are. And in this case, this isn't too complex, so it's pretty easy to do. So um, when you get latest off Perforce, off the Perforce server. Uh, you're gonna find a couple or a few new things. First of all, this example map is not what I'm using. So if I go ahead to and open a map, if you go down to LTBL and go down to the maps folder, you're gonna find, um, here, let me zoom in here. You're gonna find uh, this new level called WB Player Controller. Um, I used WB Prefix which means white box. A white box level for, in case there's anybody watching this who doesn't know, white box is basically, it means a level where you're prototyping, testing things out. So you might have a white box level for doing uh, testing with particle systems. So like a visual effects white box for like an explosion or something to test it out. You might have a white box level for uh, some kind of lighting tests that you're doing. You might have a white box level for uh, maybe some level design stuff you're testing or experimenting, maybe some a white box level for AI, a white box level for a multiplayer thing, uh, like a co-op game or something like that. In this case, I've got a white box level I created for uh, player controller, so I'm going to double click that to open it up. It's pretty dark, uh, that's on purpose. And this is just based on um, the VR uh, new level template. So I noticed that as of Unreal 4.12, they added this in. So if you were to hit Control N to create a new level, before you used to get the option for a default level or an empty level, now they added the VR basic level. So that's what this is. And I just changed some of the lighting and stuff around. Uh, anyway, let's jump in there and see what we've got. So if I play it, uh, I can't jump, but I can crouch. And the crouching is, uh, it's kind of, it works, but it's not polished. As you can see, when I crouch, the player basically pops to a crouching position and then stands back up, but it basically pops. It doesn't like interpolate nice and smoothly between crouching and standing. Um, unfortunately, that's because the built-in crouch mechanic in Unreal 4, I'm sorry to say, uh, is no good, it's no bueno. Um, so I'll have to modify it and create my own crouching function, which is actually pretty easy to do with Blueprint. I wish it worked right out of the box, but it doesn't, um, at least not that I know of. So uh, I'll fix that later. For prototyping, this is good enough. Uh, I can't jump. I disable jump. So actually, before I go any further, let me explain what the goal was. The goal was to create a character controller that... Um, I have to say it, uh, mimics another game uh, for anybody who's played like the PT demo on um, on PlayStation 4 or something like that uh, or the Resident Evil 7 teaser which is a direct ripoff of the PT demo from Hideo Kojima um, that's kind of the character controller that I'm going for so it's more of an exploration game, slow paced, very methodical movement. Uh, it's definitely not, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog or Super Mario, 
you know, or anything like that. This is meant to be a pretty slow uh, character movement. So if I walk around normal speed, and I'm using the keyboard right now, but I actually have everything mapped to a gamepad, so I could hook up an Xbox One controller to my PC and use that. I have it mapped out for everything because I'm, I'm thinking ahead and thinking about, you know, multiple platforms like Xbox One, PlayStation 4, uh, even a Steam controller and things like that. But right now I'm using a keyboard. Um, so as I walk around, my character speed is pretty slow, which is about the speed that you would expect of a game like the PT demo or one of those type of exploration uh, games, right? So that's what you uh, end up with. There's a little invisible collision here. I know what that is, but I'm not going to worry about that. Um, now, I did add a sprinting functionality because it'd be very boring to move around very slowly like this. Um, I played a game called Dear Esther for anyone who's played it. I know a lot of people love it. I, I don't I don't know what people love about that game, but the game is kind of irritating because you walk pretty slow like this, but the environments are massive. Uh, I don't know why. So it's it gets very irritating to move from point A to point B, especially if you missed your destination stop. You'll uh, you get pretty frustrated when you have to backtrack in that game. So in this game, I added the ability to sprint. So if I hold down the shift key or the sprint button on the gamepad, I'll move at about twice speed, which is kind of like a jogging pace. It's faster than speed walking. It's kind of like jogging, you know, in real life, maybe you're gonna cross the street. You don't sprint across the street like an, an, an Olympic athlete. Uh, you're pretty much gonna go at a normal jogging pace. So something like this is pretty good. And uh, it's all customizable, so if later during playtest we realize it's too slow, we can speed it up, and if it feels too fast, we can slow it down too. Um, I also added, uh, I took away the ability to jump. Um, I don't think we're going to need jumping for this specific game that we're building, so I disabled it for now. Uh, it can always be re-enabled in about two seconds flat if we needed it. I also added a flashlight mechanic, so if I hit the F key or the flashlight button on the gamepad, you'll see a flashlight turns on. It's got a gobo cookie. It's it's, it's temporary. I'll, once we get the polish stage, you know, I'll, I'll make a, a better texture for it, but right now this is the way it works. So, and this flashlight doesn't have a very far radius, so it doesn't reach too far, which makes it a little bit creepier if you're exploring like, you know, a haunted house or uh, an abandoned warehouse that's really dark or, or a basement, sewers, whatever it is, right? That's kind of the idea. So I have to get kind of close. The flashlight won't reveal things until I'm fairly close, which increases the fear factor or whatever. That, of course, is customizable. We can always change that later. Um, I can turn the flashlight on and off. It's a toggle with the F key, F for flashlight on the keyboard. And you can see that the flashlight doesn't just pop on and pop off, which is uh, how I think a lot of uh, blueprint designers end up setting it up. I wanted it to have this sort of linear interpolation between an uh, on and off, where when you turn it on, there's this sort of, like it's almost like the flashlight ramps up. It happens very quickly. It happens in about half of a second. But it adds a really cool uh, effect and polish to the flashlight. It just feels a little bit more dramatic and polished to do it that way. And I can always change that time so that I can have the flashlight turn on much quicker or even slower if I wanted to. I could even make the flashlight flicker, like if it's gonna, you know, turn off on you, the batteries are low or something like that. But you know, that's that's for future wish list stuff. So this is what I've got right now. So let me show you where this stuff is. If I go to the content browser, uh, under the I put everything under the LTBL folder, by the way, uh, just to keep things organized. I know we've got some other stuff outside of it, but let's try to keep things inside the LTBL folder. So under Blueprints, there's a couple of folders, one for game mode, and this is the game mode that I just created for this test level. And this is the player blueprint, and I'll open that in a second to show you. I also created this... Uh, a new material inside of the material folder and uh, it's this light function material which is the one that I'm using for the flashlight uh, to give it that gobo effect and I created an instance off of it and that's what's actually plugged into the flashlight so if you come in here you can override the texture map with something else if you wanted to so this is 
what that looks like for the flashlight. Uh, very simple material, nothing complex there. The idea is to get moving as fast as possible. Here's the flashlight gobo texture. And if I go to the player blueprint, I'll open it up and show it to you. So this is sort of the default stuff. Uh, by default, so we're using the first person blueprint template uh, to get this prototype project started. And it includes this stick input. Now normally you would see the stick input like this, but I've gone ahead and collapsed all of these nodes just to organize this better so that I don't have like a massive graph of blueprint nodes all over the place. I like to take sections of blueprint code and collapse them down. Um, it just makes it easier to read stuff and it just organizes stuff. These blueprints can get so out of hand with their size that uh, it's really important to be able to collapse this stuff and everything. So if I go to mouse input, I've got this. This is all default. Here's the jump functionality. It's disabled. I simply disabled it by disconnecting. You know, this used to be hooked up like that. I just went ahead and disconnected it. I even put a note and a comment box in red or pink or whatever um, that says uh, disabled. Don't know if we want jumping dot dot dot. So basically, I think for this game, we probably don't want the player to be able to jump. If we wanted to be able to climb on like boxes or obstacles, that's a whole different thing. But do we want the player to be able to like bunny hop all over the place? I don't know. Um, this is movement input stuff. I should probably collapse to this graph as well, but I kept it open just in case I need to modify it. And then down here, this is all custom stuff. So over here is the flashlight functionality. You can see it's commented up here, flashlight functionality, work in progress. Um, one key thing is, uh, this is just my personal preference. But when I work in blueprints and I comment stuff, I usually use a yellow comment box to show stuff that's still in progress and hasn't been finished yet. I'm still working on it. And I'll use red to show stuff that's deprecated. So this is stuff, functionality, that we're eventually in the final game going to get rid of and not use. The reason I don't delete it from the blueprint graph is just in case I ever have to go back and I need it again. So if this jump functionality, well, it's pretty simple right now, but let's say this was a huge graph of like 150 nodes and it's doing something complex, but we decide that we don't want it for now, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, collapse it, mark it as red to show that we're not, this isn't plugged in, it's not being used, okay? It's unconnected, it's disconnected. Um, and I won't delete it simply because what if we want to go back and use it? It's just easier to go in here and just, you know, plug these these execution nodes back in and get it working again than to go, oh, I got to rebuild this functionality again. Let me go back in Perforce history, roll back and copy and paste nodes. That's a real pain in the butt. Uh, down here is the sprinting functionality, also work in progress, which you can clearly see it's in yellow. And it's pretty simple. Uh, all it does is... It makes sure that the player's not falling and not crouching. And if they're not doing uh, those, if they're not doing those things, actually this is wrong. It shouldn't say and, it should be or. If the player is not falling or is not crouching, um, then we should be able to sprint. So let me actually correct that. I can't believe I didn't notice that before. I'm just going to delete that, and that's okay, I mean, we're prototyping, so nothing's going to be perfect, and that's the whole point of prototyping. So now it says, um, if, we're, if the player is not falling or is not crouching, then we can go ahead and sprint. And with sprinting, it just goes into the character movement component, and it takes the max walk speed, and it doubles it, uh, you know, it doubles it. You know, multiplies it by two. When we release the sprint, so the sprint button is not a toggle, it's a, it's a hold. So you press the sprint button down, and as long as it's held down, you sprint. When you let it go, you no longer sprint. So th what this guy does over here, when you release the sprint button, it takes the max walk speed, uh, the max walk speed, blah, blah, and um, divides it by two, which basically divides it by half, which puts us back to where we were before we doubled it. So 
That's how that works. Pretty simple. Then here's the crouching functionality. Um, oh, you know what? Uh, this one is the same deal. I have to put an or, not an and operator. So we do a check. Well, when we hit the crouch button, we check uh, to see if, if we're not falling or we're not sprinting. If we're not falling or we're not sprinting, then we can go ahead and crouch. And again, it's not a toggle, it's a hold. So when you press and hold the button, you'll crouch. When you release the button, you'll uncrouch, which means you stand up. And again, it's in yellow because it's work in progress. There's still a bunch of other stuff I need to do with this um, to get it to work. Flashlight functionality, pretty simple. There's a flashlight button. Um, the flashlight button is a toggle. It is not a press and hold, okay? So you just press the flashlight button, and if the flashlight was off, which it is by default, uh, it'll go through this do once node, so it closes off this sort of loop. It's not a loop, but it closes off this, um, this logic statement. And it goes through this flip-flop, and what the flip-flop does it gives the button the ability to basically do an A or B, which is turn on or off the flashlight in my case. So the first time you hit it, it goes to A, which means it plays this flashlight intensity timeline animation. And um, what that does is it updates the flashlight light intensity. So here's the flashlight component down here, which you can see if I go to my viewport. Uh, that's the flashlight. It's just basically a movable dynamic um, spotlight with a very short radius. And I can increase that radius. I can change the intensity of the light. I can do you know whatever I need to do to get this thing to look the way I want, um, the way it needs to look. If I hit the uh, if I hit the flashlight button again, if it's already been toggled on, then it'll go through B. It'll flip flop between A and B. So this time it'll go to B which means that it reverses the timeline animation, which means that it basically turns the flashlight off. And um, when, this, when this timeline is finished, it resets this do once node. That way uh, it opens the gate up again and I can you know keep hitting this again and again. And if I open up the flashlight uh, timeline, it's real simple. It's basically just a uh, keyframe at um, at zero on the timeline with a value of zero. It's it's a float, by the way. It's a float curve. And then up here on the top, we've got ourselves um, the length of the timeline is zero point two five, so zero point zero point two five of a second, which is pretty quick. Um, and the value is set to twenty five thousand. So the intensity of the light when it's on. It's 25,000. Um, that's pretty much it. And I took the curve and um, I changed it from the default linear uh, curve to uh, to an auto tangent curve. So you get this nice soft curve. And that's what gives the light that sort of uh, natural, you know, it powers on and then powers off sort of look when you turn it on and off. That's pretty much it. Uh, that's all I got done on Sunday evening. Um, again, as soon as I get more time, I'll jump in here and you know prototype and test more stuff out. Construction script, nothing there. Here's the viewport. There's no character mesh, so right now there's no first-person character. Although there's nothing stopping us from creating one and you know adding first-person arms if we wanted to or whatever, but. That starts to get a little bit more complex and more polishy. Right now we're just trying to prototype. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, that's an update from my end. Cool.